This episode is brought to you by Arden Labs Education. Sign up today to learn advanced concepts in Go, Docker, Kubernetes, Terraform, and more. Visit ardenlabs.com forward slash education for more information. Hi, and welcome to the Arden Labs podcast. Our special guest today is Kathleen Turner. Hey, Kathleen, how's it going? Good. How are you? Thanks for having me. Thanks for jumping on. Where are you on the, in the planet today? In the planet? On the planet? Where, where are you today on the planet? I'm at my apartment in Raleigh, uh, North Carolina, which is on the East Coast. Oh, so this is the week where uh, everybody's getting hit pretty hard with... Uh, those uh, cold stars. In fact, so bad, I've asked my friend Todd Rafferty, who lives in Boston, to come come down to Miami and take the cold weather away with him because for me, this is horrible. You're getting hit hard over there, right? Um. Well, we just got a little bit of snow, but it's already all gone and it's quite warm today. It's nice enough to go out for a walk in just a light sweater. So yeah, it's nothing like Boston. So <laughs> Nice, nice. Have, weren't you in Germany or Berlin recently too? Yeah, yeah. Um, last year, I did some traveling abroad during uh, the months of September and October, and I was just visiting uh, different countries in Europe, and that included Germany. Nice, nice. I, I, I've been really wanting to get back to Europe, but with the the testing requirements and everything, I've just been like, it kind of stresses me out. So I'm always impressed when somebody's like, I'm not going to be stressed out about that. I'm just I'm just going to go do it. Yeah, it's a, it, what happened is at the time the stars aligned and that um, I visited France and I applied with enough time ahead to get the health pass, uh, the European Union health pass, not just the French health pass. And so I was able to use that um, and just like easily like prove that I had the COVID vaccine and they have a lot, every country had a lot of testing centers. So it was quite easy to get a test. Um, I actually, though, from my experience, I think Miami is the easiest place to get a COVID test. <laughs> they seem to be like everywhere. If you know what you're doing, because there was a while where you had to wait on like five hour lines to get testing, but that, that's all calmed down too. All right. So let's also start. So this is a podcast about you and I'm really interested in hearing, hearing your story. But before we start that story, uh, can you give everybody the two minute sort of pitch on what you're doing today. Of course. Yeah, so I am a backend uh, senior, uh, senior software backend engineer at a startup called Perch. Uh, Perch is an e-commerce company based in Boston. And what they do is acquire uh, successful brands on Amazon uh, that sell well and scale them up so to bring them more to people uh, across the country. Uh, I write the uh, backend code for like supply chain operations. Is that all in Go? What, what, what's the tech stack that you're working on? So that tech stack is Python. Nice. Supply chain is the big thing now, right? Like everything's about this. At least I feel like in the news that pops up almost every day. So you're kind of in an active sort of space right now as it relates to the economy and the world. Yeah, it's pretty interesting to see like how everything is really connected and how small disruptions could really like affect the um how things run like smoothly in the business. But so far on our side, it's been okay. Uh, I think it's okay. Maybe I'm really shielded from all of it because I am the engineer. So I'm just like writing code. Uh, uh, but yeah, it's um, this is like a really interesting time in our history right now uh, with the supply chain crisis. So yeah, I mean, it, it didn't affect me until I couldn't buy a can of spam. I mean, it's, this was like, I was, I started to get desperate. <laughs> really? You couldn't buy spam? Where were this you? This was like right when COVID hit, everybody started like thinking it was the end of the world and they started buying canned meat. And I went to the supermarket. I couldn't buy it for like months. I actually had people in the stores looking when the deliveries came for spam so they could call me up and say, Bill, it's here, it's here, it's here. <laughs> oh my goodness. Wow. Well, Good thing you got your little canaries, like, telling you. Uh, I had no choice. Like, I didn't care about the toilet paper or the paper towels. I was like, like, and now I got upset because I know there's, like, God knows, thousands of cans of Spams 
spam, right? Sitting in houses and not being eaten. And everybody's like, well, Bill, that's what it's for. It's there to sit there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're good in scrambled eggs. So, and I've had them in hot pot and it's quite good. So there's lots, lots of things you can do with spam. <laughs> yeah. Well, most people will deny they've ever even tried it or eat it, but I'm vocal. I'm right out there. I don't care. <laughs> I like spam. Good. I mean, it's not like, a, it's not like part of my weekly grocery shop, but once in a while I'll be like, you know what? I'm going to get some spam and eggs. Okay. So, all right, so this is great. So um, I want to ask you the, the first question that I ask all of our guests. And if you've listened to the podcast a little bit, maybe you've been thinking about this already. But I love hearing the kind of origin story of when you had that first kind of magical experience with a computer, that first sort of experience that pops into your head. And before you tell me that story, just because t dates and times are kind of important, can you tell me what year you graduated high school? Sure, yeah, I graduated high school in the year 2008. 2008, okay, perfect. So I've got that kind of timeline there. That, that, and for, again, new listeners, I like asking the high school question because that puts the puts you at around 17 or kind of 18 in 2008. It gives us kind of a good time frame. So what is that first kind of thought or memory that you have about the computer? Well, if we're going to talk about really, really like primitive computer, the earliest I could remember is a Packard Bell. Um, my mom got, before I was like 10 years old, I was still living in Southern California and it was um, just a home computer that her partner at the time bought. And I uh, had the CRT monitor and everything, and uh, I think, I don't remember what was the first thing I did on it, but I did play uh, Ski Free, Sonic, and um, Solitaire on it a lot. The Windows. Windows. Windows Solitaire. I don't know. I, I remember that game. Yeah, for sure. Oh, and Minesweeper. Yeah, Minesweeper. So I played... Oh, Minesweeper. Oh, my God. I love that game. Oh, I totally forgot about that game. It's so good, yeah. So um, that was my first exposure. It's actually uh, through games. You're the first person, I think, that's even brought that game up again. Minesweeper. Actually, now I want to play that after we're done. I wonder if we can find <laughs> that somewhere. You know, games have gotten so sophisticated now. Like these, these I'm going to call them simple games, were so fantastic, right? And they just, they've kind of gotten lost, I think, in the, in the shuffle. Okay, so... That computer was it. That was a home computer that your your mom had in the house. Do you know? I guess she was using that for work, or she brought it in for everybody to kind of work with and use. I don't recall if she got it specifically. I think her partner at the time did, and I really don't remember why. But I think at the point it was just like a really exciting time that we would like have a computer in the house. Um, also, you know, um, her partner and my mom and me, we're all Ecuadorian. So like, it's just very exciting to like, just have a computer and to kind of like live in that American dream. Like, uh, like, I don't know if like, you know, we would have been able to have a computer at home at Ecuador at the time, like probably like, but it's just like another thing that was like very exciting about it and why we got to do not recall. <laughs> well, you're like around eight years old, I guess at the time then. Right. So, so that's good. Did, was that computer available to you anytime you wanted it? Did, did your, your mom have restrictions on it? You had to compete for it? I do recall them trying to put restrictions on it, but I think they just had a really simple password and I figured it out. Um, and then they just like took it away because they forgot the password. And then so it just, then I was, then I didn't have restrictions. One thing though, we didn't have internet. So that was just very different, very different experience. Um, you didn't have it yet, at, the, at least. At the we time. did not have it. No. Yeah. But you were already hacking at eight years old. So think about that. <laughs> I guess so. I was like really motivated to play games because I had loved video games. And like, I like the, the computer wasn't in the main house. So my mom had a garage um, and it was renovated to rent out to people. Um, it's how she made some like income on the side because she was a single mom. Uh, and so when the tenant was out and like, you know, she just now had that as like a space with the computer in it, I was like separate in my own little world. So like, if you could imagine an eight year old kid in a garage, like playing like Minesweeper and like games, like that's just like totally like, uh, like heaven. Cause you know, you don't have anyone looking over your shoulder. No, I can, I can visualize that. I totally appreciate it. 
think back now on a on that maybe those first kind of memories where you're actually getting you're not playing games so much, but you're you start to think about getting the computer to do your own will, right? I mean, you're already hacking passwords to gain access to the machine, and you're doing that, but. Is there this moment, maybe in high school or something, where you decide that, you know, I want to use the computer for more than, than playing games? I think, I think when I was in middle school, um, my cousins and I, we, we, like, I lived really briefly. No, actually, it was bef- actually elementary school. It was elementary school. And um, I, lived, I had moved to Boston, um, and we lived very briefly together. And at some point, someone wanted music like they wanted music they wanted some kind of i forgot what song it was so then we actually had dial-up internet like through AOL or something and then the three of us figured out torrents and then we just got limewire and got the music so that was like the the first time like of doing a non-game related thing it was just like straight into the torrents because you know we're we didn't have money so we're not gonna like buy that so you're like probably about 13 14 at the time now I think when I lived with them, I was like 11. Yeah, 11. I, I, I imagine that you're sitting there and you're like fighting through all these little, and then every little win that you get, you, you must have been, I could just see the smiles on everyone's faces as you're progressing towards, what was it like when you got finally got to download and listen to that song? Well, I personally don't didn't think the song was for me, but I was super excited about getting the song. But I kind of like once that was accomplished, I was like, cool, like, what's next? Like, I'm just very much like, okay, it's done. What's next? And then I started learning the concept of like the seeds. And I remember just like clicking, just kind of clicking through the UI, understanding, like trying to understand like, oh, data is downloaded in segments and then it's completed and just kind of getting that. It's not really tangible, but really like grounded example of like what data means and what it means to exchange data over the internet. I'm curious if at all you you felt like you were doing something wrong, like if your if your mom found out or anyone found out, was any of that kind of in in play when you were doing that? You just thought this was normal stuff and it's all good. Um, personally, I didn't think anything thing was wrong because I saw it as like getting information, but at some point. My cousin wanted a, a desktop, like H, like some kind of desktop image, uh, and she decided to use LimeWire for that. Now I th- I'm pretty sure you could get images, and she really wanted an image of like a girl with like a belly button, and like that's all she wanted because at the time she was she just wanted a belly button piercing, and I guess she got it, and then my aunt like found out, and she's like, "What is this? <laughs> like a belly button piercing on the home desktop? Like this isn't." You know, and when she got mad, she'd like go into her Spanish and like, Eto no te like <laughs> and just like, yeah. So then that's why I was like, oh, there are certain, there's certain information restricted from me on the internet. So I better delete my downloads after I see them. Wow. So, wow. <laughs> so it wasn't like I'm going to curb my activity. I'm just going to make sure that nobody can find it. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. And I didn't think that was wrong. Is like because the the consequence is being found. I don't know. <laughs> well, I mean, to be fair, the parents, right? But the adults in the room really weren't technical enough anyway, right? It was it was because that was splashed on the desktop that they saw that, mm-hmm. right? I mean, it wasn't. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and like they, I don't remember why they got a computer, but they got the computer. Um, and it was just up to us to kind of like explore and just do things with it. Uh, so. But they knew we were on, right? Because it used dial-up internet. Ah, so the phone was... They didn't have two phone lines, right? Because at some point, I put two phone lines in the house not to interrupt regular landline calls. Yeah, no, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't, get, we didn't have the two phone set up. We had... It was, a, it was just a really basic setup. Like, at that time, it was like me, my mom, my grandma, and my two cousins. We all slept in one room, like, because we were between housing. So we didn't, we didn't got no fancy two lines. <laughs> But, you know, being on the phone back then was, a, my mom had one of those uh, things you put on the back of the phone so she could have it hooked in between her shoulder and her head because she was on the phone for like hours at a time. I mean, being on the phone was a big thing back then. Yeah, definitely. Especially because we're Ecuadorian. So we had family abroad and my mom, my grandma was actually the big like canary of the family. So she'd always call people to like check up on them, see if they're okay. So it was always just like a battle of like us having internet access and her calling people and getting the tea smiths, which is like the, the tea, the, the rumors. For sure. We have, uh, where I live uh, with my wife, Allie, we have this uh, older couple. I call them the Italians because they're, they're Italian. 
uh, but they know every line of every gossip going on within like six blocks, right? And they take walks every day, and I'm always like, there they are. They're going out to uh, to you know do their rounds with everybody. They know everything. If you want to know what's going on, you you go ask the Italians. It's so. It's so that generation is was I guess just has that in them, right? Yeah, it's that social glue. <laughs> That's right. Okay, so as you as you're getting into high school, I'm I'm always curious, what is kind of your main main interests as you as you enter into high school ninth ninth grade? Are you doing? Is there there's something really consuming your time um, extracurricular? Is the computer involved? Like, what 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 does your life look like getting getting into ninth grade? Um, I think what I spend the most time on the computer on was actually drawing in middle school, and I think like freshman year and sophomore year, I was really into anime and manga, and so I would use something. I think it was like Kid Picks or something. There's just some software that you could use to make to draw drawings. Uh, so I just like write, like draw my comics and stuff on it. Uh, I would use it for, um, for homework and I would like type up reports and stuff, but, uh, nothing, nothing like programming, you know, I'd still do like a little bit of torting to get movies, but not as much, um, because by then we like finally got cable in the house so we could like use Comcast. What software are you using to do the drawings? Is it the Photoshop? Are you doing it freehand on tablets or are you trying to do everything with a mouse? Um... So the software is called KidPix. Okay, I was right. I remember that correctly. And there, and it, uh, it did come with a little tablet. So by then, my mom. So we were living in that point in my life. We were, we, were, we had moved to New Hampshire, and we've already lived there for a couple of years. And my mom had married um, someone else, and he he's actually very involved with technology for most of his um, adult life. And he used to have a computer. Well, he had a computer store at the time. And so that's like one of the things that he like had for sale for customers is like this kid pick software and like a little tablet that came with it that you could use to draw. So that was like, I felt like I was like a Cadillac kid. Oh my gosh. And now I remember, do you, I don't know if you remember Encarta, like encyclopedia. Do you remember that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. So we had that too. And for some reason, I was obsessed with reading the entire encyclopedia. <laughs> I don't know why. Like, like for fun, I would wake up on Saturday morning and just read the encyclopedia. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. And played like, like games, like, which basically like ask questions about the content in the encyclopedia. <laughs> so let me... Probably because I didn't have internet. <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you more of a personal question because it seems like you are, from the time you're eight now going into high school, at least over those maybe four or five years, you're bouncing around the country in between schools and stuff. And so are you having a hard time with making friends? Are you spending more time alone? It's like, that, that's kind of interesting to me. It, you know, like, what, what's going on there? I guess like I didn't really make friends until like maybe the final year of middle school and freshman year of high school. But between 11, you know, when I moved to Boston from California, which is I was 10 years old and until I was like 13, uh, I had a really hard time making friends because, um, at least when I was in like in elementary school between, uh, Boston and like New Hampshire, I lived in Burlington and I was like really teased there, like really badly. Like people were very mean to me. Um, so yeah, I just pretty much didn't hang out with anyone and just spent time on like the computer, uh, whenever I could, uh, we didn't have a computer in Burlington. So I think I just mostly drew or like watch Dragon Ball Z on TV or like went in hikes in the woods. Um, but once I was in New Hampshire and I was like, I think 12 or something, I, we got a home computer and then that's when I just, you know, drew and like read the Encarta encyclopedia. And like at some point I made friends and then, but I don't think I spent less time after making friends. I like, once we got internet access in New Hampshire, um, like the second house in New Hampshire, uh, then I was just reading stuff like information. Do you enjoy drawing on paper, on the tablet? But I mean, I, Eric here, who helps us manage everything here at Arden on, on the art side, I, I, I see him do crazy things on the tablet, hand, hand drawings, and then he takes that and he goes into Illustrator or Photoshop, I don't know which one, and, and then he like really brings it to life. But he does a lot. He starts almost everything first by hand on paper, then on the tablet, and then kind of cleaning it up. Do, do you take that same kind of approach what is your feeling about 
handwriting on tablets and things? Um, so what I do now is I actually draw and like paint through different mediums. So on paper, on like I do watercolor painting and I do have an iPad now. I just got it like last year in May, like for the first time ever. I like had an iPad like in like myself. Um, and I don't do any of that. Like I don't, I just draw, I just start drawing. Like I don't need to draw a draft. I just know what I need to see. Like I see it in my mind. I know exactly what I need to do to move my hand to achieve that. And yeah. And, but I do not enhance the, the drawings with uh, Photoshop or anything like that because um, my objective is just to like, kind of like have that thing come into being and having like simple drawing software is sufficient for that. I think it's called like vectorize or something. Eric shaking his head. Yes. Vectorize. So that's cool. Is any of this, at least digital art that you're producing, like available for anyone to see. I'd love to see some of the. You've been doing it for a long time. It has to be it has to be really good. Honestly, no. Like I drew a lot as a kid, but you know, back then we didn't really have cloud um, storage. And um, again, with my mom's partner at the time, they're no longer together. He was very skeptical of cloud storage, and he said that you know like hardware backups like are better um i don't know if he still has those so i do not have any uh digital drawings from when i was a child uh but i you know still have my paper drawings and i don't really post them anywhere on the internet because they're just mostly for me i think i think what i have done is i've like posted one like one uh self-portrait as my twitter profile once and then um another time on instagram so I'm just like not super motivated to show people. It's not that I'm like embarrassed or self-conscious. It's just that I don't care. Um, the art's for you. Yeah, I just like drawing. I just like doing, so. I love the story that he didn't believe in clouds. I think at some point we all age out. You're, you're young, so you're not there yet. But at some point you're gonna just say, you know what, Bill talked about aging out, I've aged out. You just don't kind of see or believe in the next kind of generation of tech that's, that's in front of you. Yeah, I mean, maybe that's after blockchain. So, because I mean, I'm, you know, I think blockchain's like pretty good and has a lot of practical like applications. But I mean, I don't know what's beyond that. Yeah, I think there's a lot of people my age who are already feeling like they've aged out because they don't see or get blockchain because they've been developing for so long. They just feel like it's not the right, right? It happens. But I have a whole generation of people. Um, in their 30s and younger who just see amazing things you can do with blockchain, right? And they're, they're moving it forward. And I think that's good. I think it's important, right? The next generation pick up and, and try different things. Yeah, definitely. And just sometimes it's about like have just challenging yourself to find something that will give you that easy satisfaction. So for me, like um, I did a little bit of development for Kin uh, Crypto uh, really briefly and it, I wasn't like super excited about it, but it was fun at the time. And uh, I think the only way I really got into crypto was just like getting like minting an NFT <laughs> only because I really liked uh, the art style. Like I didn't really care. I don't really care about NFT flipping. I don't care about acquiring NFT pieces. There's just this art style I really like. So I was like, oh, I'll just acquire it. I, I, I think that's totally fair, right? I, I love the technology behind it all. I'm not sure I'm a fan yet of some of the applications that are being built on top of it. But that's, I mean, I find the art actually interesting because there is a genre of art right now related to these NFTs, right? It's, I, I'm not an artist. I'm going to use all the wrong words, but kind of cartoonish, kind of raw. It's not trying to be, how would you describe it? Because uh, I'm going to fail. So NFT means a non-fungible. Well, I mean, I mean the art, the art, the art side of it. How would you describe the art oh, that people art. are producing related? Because it all has, you're right, it, there's this genre of art that you can definitely look at and say, yes, that's part of the NFT crowd. I just can't describe it. You know, I think that's the point. I think there's just so many diverse perspectives and artists that are using NFTs to like publish their works um, and distribute their art is that it's maybe it is supposed to be hard to describe it. Um, you know, at one point it could be like very 2D and then you could have like the gorillas or like the lions or whatever, or like what I have, which is Milady, And it's just like this anime. It's basically anime and like, um, like kind of 80s aesthetic kind of blended together with like fashion. So that's why I like it. 
Uh, but I've seen some other NFTs that, um, you know, it doesn't have to be like exactly an image. It could be like um, binary data too. So like you could, um, one thing that my, so my partner does 3D printing um, and he like does his own like designs for like the shapes. And like one thing we we're talking about is if like, you know, one way for him to make some like money, like he's a grad student now, um, is to actually like mint an NFT like with his design so that like you could have like something to 3D print and it's like yours. And there's some cool projects where I've seen like some people design like clothes um, as NFTs. Like, so the idea with that is that you can't buy the real, the real life item that you would wear until you own the NFT. No, but the 3D printing one is super interesting because it brings the, the virtual world back into, I'm going to say the real world, right? Where now you can actually print that, that thing you own. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's pretty cool. And it just uh, allows someone to have an additional like means of income. Like the, it's about, I think like what I'm really excited about NFTs is empowering creators to like make income. I think that that's like at its core, you know, what I really like about it. I mean, there's other potential too, you know, like documents and like things like that, but I, I don't know. I like seeing what people make out of it and I like that people can make money out of it. So I love I, I love talking to to young people like yourself to get a sense of like what they're excited about, what they see in the future. Again, like sometimes I, I feel like I'm too old and I can't can't see what what's what's there ahead of me. So I love these types of conversations. Right, we got to get back to you here. So let's talk about high school. Let's talk about high school. So you're, you're entering high school. You're you're doing a lot of drawing. What is it that you're kind of interested in high school are you playing sports you do music what's consuming most of your time i'd say honestly it was drawing i didn't do music um you know i was like in the college and like honors classes so i did schoolwork um i did do sports i did swimming i tried track i don't i don't think i had anything that significantly consumed my time i was just i was just kind of doing tasks here and there doing homework doing extracurriculars I would cook with my grandma often, um, learn how to cook from her. So nothing really where I was just like, you know what, I'm going to like build something through my computer. It never dawned on me to think that because I like never, no one ever told me about programming in high school, like no one. And like, there was no like programming classes where I was that we were told of. There was like the most of a, any technology based course. It was like once in middle school and it was around typing. So that wasn't available at my school. So um, most of my use of the computer was really just getting information and completing schoolwork um, and drawing. So it was very, very simple. So then as, you, as you're as you entering your senior year of high school, you have to be starting to think about what's after high school. What Do you remember kind of what you were thinking about in terms of what's after high school for you? Yeah, absolutely. So um before I had gone to call, like, you know, before senior year, I think around junior year, I'd gone to my, like, my home country, Ecuador, for the first time ever, like, in uh, my life. Um, and it was really eye opening because, you know, I came to the United States when I was eight months old. So I, like, viewed myself as American, but I have a blended identity because I had a Spanish speaking household. My grandma raised me and all that. But it was really interesting to see how uh, the mining business and, like, uh, chocolate producing business really like abused the land. Um, and I just will always remember um, just my water that came from mining operations, just washing to the rivers. And so like, I like became really aware of that and like the human and imp the hum the impact humans have on the environment to make a profit. And so by the time I was like thinking about college and what I was going to do, it was definitely around environmentalism, but it was more on the business side. Like how can we like have business, like not, like abuse the environment like that, which is like, there's no like major for that. So the closest thing um, that I had to it when I got into UNH, I went in undeclared, but then I declared as like environmental, like economics. <laughs> so, yeah. So you decided that you wanted to stay, I guess, locally. Went to, is that the University of New Hampshire? Yep. And you enrolled there with the idea that you wanted to understand, was it more economic, political? Was it more you wanted, was your idea that I was, you were going to go work for some company and try to help set policy or work at government and try to help set policy? Like, You know, I had no idea. It was more on like, 
there is economics which deals with like oh yeah and also i was really good at economics in like high school i took ab classes there so i think i just really liked economics as under understanding of systems and money um and how they tie with like uh our society but also the environmental side of it and a lot of what i remember learning in environmental economics and like what i got the impression of uh, from what learning about the program is basically how do you quantify um the environment as a resource um you know, because a lot of times, you know, uh, businesses will do things and they do it at what they perceive is a lower cost to their operations. But really, the behavior is uh, very damaging to the environment and it's much more expensive um, way to dispose of something. Uh, you know, perfect example is like Kodak, like Kodak used to dump uh, their pollutants from their filmmaking operations into the river. And that was cheap for them at the time. But, you know, now, you know, in the present moment, well, it's settled since then. Uh, the same taxpayers had to pay uh, remediation uh, in that. So, did you? I, I still a lot I want to talk about university, but did you end up with that kind of? What, what degree did you end up with after four years in the University of New Hampshire? Um, yeah, so I actually changed majors. So I guess um, I think it was like my first year. I learned, I, I was already taking, because I had taken AP courses in economics in high school, um, I was already in like junior level courses in my freshman year for economics in my freshman year of college. And then I was like, this is boring, um, it's too easy. So then I, I like randomly took this like science class related to hydrology. And then I was like, oh, this is actually interesting because it's like hard, it's about water systems. So after my first year, I had switched into environmental science. And then I was like kind of bored with environmental science because it was very, it, it a lot, you know, some at some level it is very like, how can I say this, um, scientific and that you're very in the observant sense, uh, but not, not really quantify, like you can't really quantify things. And so then I explored math courses um, and then I just got the applied like minor in math because by the time I was in my senior year, I like like this idea of environmental systems, and I like quantifying these systems through uh, mathematical models. So it's just kind of like an evolution that just like has like no practical like application in the world until like you go into environmental consulting, which that's where I ended up anyways. So yeah. <laughs> all three of my daughters started university with one idea in mind, and they all kind of finished <laughs> in a different way. Maybe keeping a minor or major in the core subject, but they all sort of found a different, or they, they realized that that really wasn't for them. So I, I'm, I'm not shocked that, I think that's what the good thing about university, right? You, you kind of really begin to solidify what it is you want to do, what you don't want to do. But you're coming out of university with a science slash mathematical sort of degree, right? Like you've moved away a little bit from the political, social, economic aspects of the environment. At that point, coming out of university with that degree, I guess we're talking 2012, um, what is it, you, st you must start looking for jobs, right? So what, I'm, I'm kind of curious where you're applying out of university, or did you have internships as well already in university and, and yet? You were kind of setting yourself up. So I pretty much went straight to a, a, like a fully funded like master's program after I finished undergrad. Um, I like got my first like, I don't know, I'm like pretty addicted to work. So like my freshman year of like of college, I was like, even though I hadn't even entered the environmental science program yet, I was already like harassing professors to see like if I could work in their labs. Because I was just like, what am I going to do all summer? Just take calculus like two? That's boring. Like, I need to do something else. So like some people are just like, oh, I'll just like go to a pool. And I'm just like, no, I'm just going to do science. And so like I ended up working for this professor who ended up like mentoring me for like my first research project. And I was doing like scientific research my sophomore year and uh, junior years. What was that research on? So uh, sophomore year, I was, um, I was part of the McNair Scholars Program which is basically a program funded uh, by the U.S. government where they identify uh, underrepresented folks and set up pathways for them to become professors at uh, universities, essentially get a doctor's degree. And so that I was a part of that program my sophomore year, entering junior year, and I did a, I, the research topic I created was like on 
the hydrology of like the water Durham watershed, um, Durham, New Hampshire watershed, just understanding the effects of sidewalks, um, roads, and how it affects how water flows in the land. It's called hydro modification and just understanding what that will look like with climate change and changes in precipitation uh, into like 2100. So yeah, that's what I did. Uh, and then the other study, I got into this research program at Stanford for the summer and I worked more in a chemical area. So it was around um, bacteria and archaea in the oceans and how they fix nitrogen, which is basically changing the form of nitrogen. So you, were, you weren't kidding that seeing that water pollution in Ecuador really kind of changed your life because even these two studies, research projects that you're doing are, are based on water. Yeah. So you decide that you're going to go get a, you're going to continue your education. So you, I'm actually curious for a second, were you living on campus during your undergraduate? Were you still living at home? Were you commuting? And then what happens also as you decide to, are you working to support yourself? Like talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, I actually did live on campus uh, my entire college uh, education because my situation at home wasn't exactly stable and college provided that stability. And that's actually part of the reason why I was like, I need a job because it kept me away from home. And with the um, research programs that I got into, like for the McNair Scholars Program and the Search Scholars uh, Program at Stanford, they like pretty much fund you like the whole summer to stay at the college campus. So, um, and I was like, hell yes, like I want to live at work. <laughs> and, the, and the rest of the education was loan based? Yeah, um, I had scholarships, but uh, during the school years, I worked in labs or uh, I think I also worked in like the computer, the computer labs too, to help people with like technical problems. So you had nice jobs in the scope of the field. You weren't out working at um, doing retail or making sandwiches or anything like that, you were able to find work there on campus. Yeah. yeah that's great. I'm very lucky. So you decide you're going to go into this master's degree. That's another, that's another two years now, right? So you're looking through 14. What is it that your master's degree is then focusing on? Uh, yeah. So by the time I was in my senior year, I wanted to focus on some part of the environment, and that was like oceanography and specifically chemical oceanography. So uh, I ended up getting into uh, URI, which is University of Rhode Island's uh, Graduate School of Oceanography, uh, to study oceanography and specialize in chemical oceanography. So, sorry, there's a lot of oceanography in my sentence. So then you moved to you moved to Rhode Island. Yes. Where the water is super cold. <laughs> I, I hate being cold. <laughs> yeah, the ocean state. Yeah. So. Okay, so you do your two years there, and does anything change in those two years? Did you end up finishing that degree? Did did anything else kind of move you in a different direction over those two years in Rhode Island? Yeah, definitely. So I think when I started out with science in my undergrad, I was very much doing a lot of field work, and then in Stanford, I did a lot of like chem, chem like work in the lab, like growing uh, um, archaea and bacteria to do my experiments and. That's something that was really important because I realized that I'm terrible at the lab. Like, I'm just a bad pipetter. And I was just like, what do I do? But I was really good at the data and like writing like um, automation for Excel stuff. And by then I had already learned some MATLAB programming in my math courses. That was like, like junior year of college, like taking uh, linear algebra was the first time I was ever exposed to programming. I remember when I had my first assignment and I was like, what is this? And they're like, this is a for loop. I'm like, what? <laughs> uh, but then by the, so that was actually important because then I really liked that. And then by the time I had my senior capstone, I did like a, like a math model on like uh, some kind of, I think it was like the nitrogen cycle and like the estuary. And then by the time I got to college, uh, gra graduate school, I was more interested in applying uh, environmental models um, and understanding the chemistry of the environment that way. So I did a lot more I did a lot of chemistry courses, and I also did a couple of programming courses, um, kind of like, think of like, like applied science and programming kind of stuff. But it, was, it wasn't like software engineering as we see it, you know, because software engineers actually write really nice code. S code written by scientists is like, oh my god, like, like you just have so many constants that like mean specific things, and it's just like totally different. So my, my first experience with MATLAB was some person wearing a t-shirt that said like x equals 
A, B, something like that. At this slide, I was like, what is that? And I looked it up and I saw MATLAB. I've never played with it at all. Did you enjoy working in, in, in MATLAB? Oh my God, yes. I liked it so much that my friends made fun of me for, like, for it in college and undergrad. Like, oh my God, the cat's with their MATLAB. She's so happy. <laughs> but I think the experience of seeing, I guess, scientifically written code has also kind of helped you even today maybe with the ideas of readability and things like that. Uh, yeah, definitely. And also thinking about like what you could do with programming too, you know, cause like a lot of like programming, at least I try to write code that's very deterministic. Like, you know, it does very exact and precise things and it follows a procedure. Um, but with science, it's a lot of, you know, especially environmental modeling, it's a little bit more chaotic and you actually use um, data to kind of mimic behavior that happens in the real world, which is definitely more manebulous. But, but I'm wondering if you saw, did you see programming as a tool or did you just see the applications and, and math equations as the tool? I kind of saw like the equations and concepts as a tool, but the programming as a canvas. Cause very, like very artistic in a sense. Did you do any form of programming during your master's degree? Uh, yes, um, it was very simple Python uh, and MATLAB, and it was mostly just kind of like processing a lot of chemistry data and like automating the, the processing for it. Um, my master's thesis was related to ocean acidification, uh, which basically happens when um, there's excessive uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And so the ocean is a, a really big store of carbon. And so what happens is the ocean is able to store extra carbon but it acidifies. And so it's like, how do you model that through math um, and knowledge of chemistry? So, and so with that, like I had to analyze a lot of data and that's where I got exposed really to the practical side of programming, which is like being able to like batch and like automate processes. And, and that's when you got introduced to Python because you were like, I have this file of data. Now I want to graph it or I want to visualize it or I want to crunch it. And somebody was like, Python's like geared up for this. Yeah, so um, pretty much because I was doing a lot of my work in MATLAB and then I uh, there was this random like scientific programming course. So I was like, I should take it. And they worked in Python. It was actually it's actually Python and Perl, uh, which is like hilarious. But uh, but Perl's really important for like text inputs. And like, it, I don't know if it still is important, but it was very important for biologists doing like genetics work, you know, A, B, G, whatever, all that stuff. So that was an extra class you took. It wasn't part of your master's. You just thought... You know, I need to learn this stuff to be able to finish the work that I want to do. Uh, yeah, I think it was more like I want to learn this stuff because I want to see if there's something I could do differently that will take me to the next level of my work. Like, because I could have done the work already, like with what I know, but I was just like, what, like, how can I push the envelope? So just decided to learn something else. So do you remember like that kind of, you must have had these light bulb moments in that class where you're like, oh my God, I can do that. Oh my God, I can do this. Oh my God, I can, I can do this with Python. Yeah, absolutely. Because you know, by that point, I had only been using programming uh, to take in data, solve math equations, and, you know, do like run environmental models. And uh, by then, like when I was taking this like uh, scientific programming, programming course, I was exposed to a lot of biology problems and like text programming, you know, like regex. That was like that in, in math in that class is the first time I've ever heard of regex. And then I was like, oh, wait, there's this whole other thing to programming. And then that's when I like started to learn like, oh, you can make like images in programming and there's just like, you know, it's just bits and you can do anything like there's no limits. Do you have this moment, at least right now, like during that, that, that time that you're doing a master's where you ended up being able to use Python to solve a problem and you were just like, you're like, yes, I can't believe I, I like practically got to use this for something I was doing. Uh, honestly, for my master's work, my personal master's work, no, but my partner at the time, he was doing his like PhD in like physics, biophysics, and like he needed to like, he got this like code base and he just didn't know how to navigate it. And I was just like, oh, let me just read your biophysics code. And then I just like helped him set up so that he could run and do his analysis. That's like the only time I actually used Python. It wasn't even for my work. It was for me to do other people's work. But that's brilliant, right? Like that, that. That's like power to me. That's like, that feels just, that, that's, that's an awesome little story. Yeah, because it was just like, I took this class and now I'm like helping people and I really like helping people. So what happens now is you're about to graduate uh, from your master's program. 
what's you gonna you're going towards a PhD at this point or now you're deciding maybe I want to get into to the workforce or in the field yeah so I never even like I actually got had a job lined up before I even like formally finished my master's because like the first year, the first semester I joined the master's program, I was like taking my classes and learning about academia because I wanted to see if I would like getting a PhD. And I thought I was going to become a professor and like have my own lab and stuff. Uh, but then I just learned about academia and it just didn't move fast enough. Um, there's a lot of grant, like I wrote like three scientific grants and it was just like, no, this isn't for me. So then I explored other options and then consulting was the most uh, pragmatic choice because uh, it paid a living wage. Um, the opportunities were available in like near me in Rhode Island. And um, it seemed like there was like uh, heavy recruiting from them for the program I was in. So uh, I already had a, like interviewed uh, with that with that consulting company. I think like the last spring I needed to do my my master's work to like wrap up the data analysis, like take my last last classes, essentially. Um, so then what was your role in this job? Was it the same kind of continuation of what you were doing in your master's? Yeah, pretty much. So uh, the company is called RPS ASA, and basically what they did, the bulk of their work is essentially applying models, like chemical models, like oceanic models, like fluid dynamic models to predict incidents and how they would spread in the environment. Think like oil spill, like a tank of methane exploding, like things like that. Um, so we would build and uh, run these models to predict what the sphere of impact would be, how many people would die, uh, how many people would have, you know, this much irritation in their lungs uh, if they were within like this difference, th this is in the epicenter. Um, how many, you know, I didn't really do, they also did like biology, like estimates. So um, the biggest thing I did when I worked there, I don't know if you remember the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. I remember Exxon or something, but, I, and, and maybe I do, but I don't want to say 100% I do. Um, so basically, um, it was uh, a massive incident by BP. Oh, BP. I remember their stock like dropped to nothing and it was a big, 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 big mess. Right. And uh, it was a massive amount of oil dumped into the ocean. And part of the problem was that uh, they were using chemicals to think that they were dispersing the oil. But in fact, they were actually causing more harm than good. Um, and I was like part of the team to essentially uh, predict where the oil would go in the ocean in the sense of physics because of the ocean currents carrying the oil, but also um, the chemical part of it because there are, there are uh, microorganisms in the ocean that will biodegrade the oil as well. Um, so it's kind of predicting that concentration. So it's like three-dimensional space, so physics and um, chemistry. So modeling, mod modeling that. So essentially decay. All right, two, 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 two questions here. Um, I guess, were you able to create visuals for all of this modeling? Like, would you be able to run a, a little movie when you were all done to see where all this stuff was going? Yes, absolutely. And we did that through MATLAB because uh, Python was not good enough for it. It's not powerful enough for the millions of um, data points that we had per second to predict that. I'm curious who was paying your company for this sort of research? Or governments paying for this or private businesses? The EPA. Because we were on the team to basically come up with the, how much damage to quantify the damage to the environment in dollars and cents. So we were the team for that. Uh, so, you know, that like giant fee that they had to pay in the end, like after the harm that they've caused, we were a part of that, making that, that bill. So, so you started. Uh I assume you started this job around 2014 with this kind of, how long were you there? How long were you with them? I was with them for two years. Um, I got laid off in 2016. Did you know the layoff was coming or did it just like overnight you got a, you said you got two weeks and you're done? Yeah, absolutely. Because uh, consulting is a very competitive environment and like with consulting, at least for environmental consulting, we had to like log every hour of work to charge specific projects. So every hour of work I did was tracked and assessed for its value. Um, and so when I realized that it, there was like a lot of um, disorganization in 
the company because it was acquired. Uh, it's in, it's been acquired now by RPS, uh, which is a much larger company. Um, and I was getting less projects. I realized that like less projects means less funding for me, so I might be laid off. And there were other people that were being laid off um, too uh, because there was just I think there was a problem with the oil. Like there was a problem with oil. I don't recall if it was like um, a trade war or something, but there was a massive halt in uh, exp oil exploration. Oh yes, the price of oil was very low. And so the companies didn't want to do oil exploration. It wasn't profitable for them. So that meant less uh, work for us. Did you get ahead of that layoff? Were you able to get another job? Was there time, did they give you severance? Like how does all that work? Actually, by the time, I guess like around 2015, I realized that I hated uh, environmental consulting because basically uh, businesses only cared about uh, quantifying impact that they could have and how the maximal damage would um, they pretty much they pretty much worked in parameters of like what is the maximum damage that we could do given our funds to pay off a fee risk assessment economic risk 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 it wasn't really about helping the environment it was how much do we have to save to deal with that yeah pretty much but uh, so then I just became really interested in uh, coding and making the code better because there was a lot of people coming in and out of the org. So I, then I was like spending a lot of time refining the code and just making it more efficient, run faster. And by then I had no idea what an algorithm was. Like I took numerical methods and like had the equations to kind of demonstrate like what it means to like solve a, like a specific math problem. But I never thought what I was doing was like trying to figure out the most optimal algorithm. I, I was just doing it. Like I was just like changing the code evaluating like doing the math in my head and just like coming up with optimal ways to make it run faster so um so yeah by then uh, by the time i was laid off i was like oh i'm just gonna do this but not for science because i'm gonna see what else is out there and so by then there was this program called launch code um which was started off by uh, the founders of square to like help people who do not have a cs degree like transition into uh, careers in tech um and so yeah i got into their program and did their uh, free like coding like coding course that like was I think two or three times a week in the summer and so I had that lined up. What else were you doing? So let me let me get. So you decided to to start getting a bit of not a university formal education, but you decided to try to do more formal education and programming. You got into this um, programming. Is it a boot camp or program? Say program over the summer. Yeah, they called it a boot camp, but I mean, it's nothing like the boot camps that we know now. It was pretty much like it's a class and you complete projects. And that was free for you to do over the summer. Yeah, but the classes were themselves like maybe two or three times a week and they were like two to three hours. So that still left a lot of time for me, one, to search jobs because that's part of unemployment, right? You have to search for jobs, uh, which is also very hard at the time because like environmental consulting companies were all affected by the oil prices, actually. Um, and then I was just like, uh, you know what, I'm just gonna make my own job. So then I just like, after I learned, like, that was the first time I ever learned web development, like ever uh, in my life. And then I was like, all right, PHP is cool. So I'm just gonna go to Craigslist and make a post saying I know PHP and put a link to my project that I pushed on Heroku. And maybe someone will pay me to do this. And someone did. Uh, and yeah, then I got my first gig. That was, that was literally my first programming job. Was me like you're okay. Hold on, hold on. So you're you get laid off. It's the summer. You're you're doing this boot camp two three times a week, a number of hours. You're learning. What are you learning? In, are you learning PHP and HTML and stuff in the boot camp? Yeah. So in the boot camp, we start off actually with um, CS50, which is like the Harvard Intro to CS course. So that's like where we learn about basics like algorithms and like merge sort and things like that. And that's C programming. It's like C programming. And after you're done with that, then you had like two tracks. I forgot what the other track it was. I think it was Internet Things. But the one the other track was like web programming. And that's where PHP came in. And you took a project you did for that and you kind of showcased it as I can do this. And you went to Craigslist and you said, was somebody like to hire me to do work? And somebody said, yeah. Yeah, pretty much. And I also, um, I finished my assignments pretty quickly too. Like they weren't really that difficult. So I found the book Think Python because Arnell, um, 
Arnell, uh, he's one of the teachers in the course, and he's actually a, a really prominent on tech entrepreneur in Providence. He was like, I always asked him, like, what do I do next, Arnell? Like, this is like, I'm done. And so he would like tell me other things I could learn. Um, so yeah, he told me about Think Python. He's like, just finish the book Think Python, and I finished it in like a couple of weeks or something like that. But this this first job you got building a, a website in PHP. Um, actually, I'm really curious. Were you since it's on Craigslist scares me, right? Like, how did you validate that this person was legit? How did you get paid? How much did they pay you actually to do this? Like, was this a month of work? Was it a week of work? And it ended up being a month because that's when I finished it. And by then I was actually hired for my first uh, job in tech, like formally, which was um, a test automation engineer uh, for Python. But I, I think I got like a few grand from it and I didn't write it from scratch. Uh, what happened is there's this, this is going to sound crazy. So prepare yourself. <laughs> there's this guy in Rhode Island who bought an old train station and he wanted to bring back uh, commercial trains to unite, I think it was like Worcester to Providence or Woonsocket or something. He was going to bring trains back and uh, he needed a booking website for the seats. And so he found, and I forgot what it was, this open source thing written in PHP. Uh, oh yeah, it was like a point of sale. At point of sale, booking and everything. And he's like, I need you to make this to work for me and it needs to go live. So I did that. I made modifications and that's how I learned about Amazon. Why did I choose Amazon over Heroku? I don't know. I think I was like, I want to learn Amazon. So like, that's like I deployed it there. <laughs> so yeah. That's a great project. Like that was a great project for you to fill up that time and you got money for it. Yeah. And you know what? In terms of legit, I was like, I don't know. I take risks and like it did seem sketchy at first because there's this guy like replying to email, but I'm like, you know what? I'm the sketchy one. I'm the one who posted this and I look and I think that I could do this but that's like when you're put into situations like that and you need to like figure out a solution fast because I needed to make rent I wasn't making rent so it was about putting that fear aside and like meeting the objective which is be able to pay rent <laughs> did they he must have given you a little money up front right uh no uh no because I was too afraid to ask but you got paid at the end of the day so that that's good and then you landed into this you you got accepted to test automation with Python yeah, so um, the company is called Vector Software, and basically they, and this is a mouthful, uh, write soft testing automation software for embedded software, and that's in C++, but there was a test automation system for engineers to write that software that tested it in unit tests and integration tests, and that was written in Python, and I wrote the testing software for that testing software. <laughs> so. Were you excited about that job? Or did you just take it because it was it was there? And then how long were you there for? Yeah, of course I'm excited because I had zero dollars in my bank account by the time I started. <laughs> like I don't have a social net. Like I don't have family to support me and like pay me rent. To I just had to make money, and that's all I cared about. Um, and it was good. Sorry, you asked a follow up question. Yeah, how long how long did you stay with that company? I stayed with this company for, let's see, 2017 and left 2018. So, oh, about a year. What do you think? Did you, okay, I'm, I'm kind of curious, right? Like you, you took the job because you really needed income. It was in Python. It was in tech. So you were in the right kind of place. Do, what do you feel you got out of that job? You were only there a year. I'm going to ask why you left again. But what do you feel you got out of that job? Um, well, first off, uh, income. Second off, um that was the first time I actually had received, like, it was my first programming job ever, and they were aware of it. And I actually joined at the same time, uh, someone with a CS degree had, they had completed at the University of Rhode Island. So we were both like cohorts. And it was the first time I was ever mentored, like ever in my life, like for a job. And I had mentorships as a scientist, but never like in programming, like mentored like that. And Arnell mentored me to like, learn and do self discovery. But this is about actually writing code that you're going to have to live with for years. So, and these guys are really good at it. Like they just like, they were the kind of guys, uh, there was two of them too, uh, cause they were teaching us so that they could do other stuff, uh, that read the entire like programming books of, uh, O'Reilly on like Python and like code testing, code testing and all that stuff. And, you know, I learned about like objects and abstractions and dependency ejections, uh, unit testing. That was a big, that was the biggest thing actually, if I could take back my statement. Like, like we didn't write unit tests in those boot camp, boot camp classes. That was like not a concept. 
But then I went to this, which is like for the business to survive, this is, this is to help other businesses pass, you know, and it's through unit test and understanding testing and COVID coverage. Um, because for embedded software, you know, which goes in cars and planes, it's critical that, you know, the code is accurate um, and you do that through testing. So that was, I think that was the biggest takeaway. I think I always have that with me wherever I go. So well, that sounds like you got more than just a job. You got a, a, another year of education. Yeah. And then I learned Jenkins. Oh, God. So, yeah, part of the job. So it wasn't only writing code. I was exposed to Jenkins for the first time. And yeah, so in a sense, I was exposed to like they didn't have Amazon services. They had their own servers. Um, so exposed to that and, uh, you know, just kind of running Jenkins nodes that would run the automated testing. Because uh, So what happened to a year later? Something something new falls into your lap? So uh, I think four months or six months into the job, I was like, I'm bored. So I need to do something harder. So then I talked with Arnell and he was like, oh, I'm start. He launched his own boot camp because that's what Arnell does. He just like creates things out of nothing. And yeah, you were there for, you actually, you met Arnell for the, for the collaborative event. He's like, yeah, I'm, I'm starting uh, career devs. And this is basically a real coding boot camp where we're actually going to like connect you with companies in Providence. And so like, so I was like, oh yeah, can I join? I asked him to join. He said, yes. And then that's where I was exposed to more web development because in the director job, I learned a lot about uh, automated testing, but in uh, career, in the career to get Jeb's track, that's where I was like first exposed to like JavaScript and like APIs um, and things like that. Uh, and yeah. And then after that, I completed some, a few JavaScript projects. Um, I think I built a progressive web app and I was like, I don't know. I learned about it on my own. I was like convinced this was going to be the future of all apps. Um, it's not, it's React native. And anyways, or maybe Vue, who knows? Uh, but yeah. And then I got another job. Um, I, I wanted a different job because the people, uh, one of my coworkers who was like technically assigned my mentor, he was like very, um, he's not very good to work with. And he would yell at me a lot um, for, stuff not even related to work it's just kind of bizarre and he would like kind of bring up that i'm a woman like so i was just like i gotta get out of here also i want to make more money so then uh, i started a profile on angelus because i was like what the hell is this and by the way i had no idea this is like related to vc and then uh the founder uh of cat of catch at the time which is called rio found me there and then messaged me he's like hey you say you know python Oh yeah, I did take a Golang class too, and Go. So I put Go in there. Like, do you want to do you want to work for us or something? I was like, yes. Well, what site was that that you listed yourself on? Angel Angel List. Angel List was that a site for people to kind of post resumes and stuff? I don't know if I've heard of Angel List. Angel List is basically a, a place where startups can post um, information about themselves. Startups could post jobs and people who are looking for jobs could post their resumes. And this is basically a main, the main hiring platform for startups. It's kind of like LinkedIn, but for like startups, really. It's like a LinkedIn and Crunchbase in one. So this company, this startup found you? Yeah, Andrew found me, yep. And you went and worked for them for how long? I worked for Catch uh, for from 2018 to 2021, so almost three years. It would have been exactly three years had I left in May, but I left in January. All right, so three years is a is a good amount of time. You must have there must have been a lot of positive experiences going on there for you to be there that long. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, I was, you know, I came in pretty early. You know, there was other code that's already been written there before, um, but I would say I was the third or fourth backend engineer ever hired there, um, and wrote out a lot of the core parts of the of the platform which is uh retirement and health insurance and a bunch of other stuff and also i was like the main person who managed our aws cloud infrastructure so so i learned terraform from it too is there any moment up through that job where you're still thinking about wanting to be involved in environmental issues like the way you kind of started your career because you're kind of far away from it at this point you know honestly no because i was learning so much like i felt like that job was you know working a startup you have to just hit the ground running and just learn 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 develop sink or swim and so i was just so caught up in learning the technology um and the problems around it which is basically uh automating uh basically benefits for people who are self-employed 
So I was pretty far from the environmental science part, but that's because I was learning the tech. And also, you know, I learned GraphQL too. I'm like in, in, in that situation, you have to do a little bit of everything and you have to be really productive. Like you're a core member of the, of the dev team at that point because you also get in so early. I, I'm curious your thoughts on somebody who's still fairly new and trying to break in. It seems to me from listening to your story that maybe startups could be better for somebody in that situation as opposed to maybe a, a larger, well-established company where you don't get the same same kind of things thrown at you. Do you have any thoughts on that? I think, you know, like any engineer that's going to answer some kind of question about a problem, it depends. You know, it depends on like the rate of growth you want to do. It depends on what you want to learn. And it depends on your comfort levels um, and how you want to manage your growth. Um, for me, I'm just very much like addicted to learning and pushing the envelope. But for others, um, like the people at the last company I worked at, Vector Software, they're very much into the want to track, they want to track, they want to only work uh, seven hours a day and go home at five o'clock. And so I think, you know, for anyone who's debating about working at a startup or working at a big company, you know, and they're really well start run, well run startups that uh, you could have proper work life balance. But um, from my experience, uh, I think like, one thing to think about startups is like, are you ready to like be in charge of your own growth um, so you can meet the needs of the business so that it'll survive and actually ship the product. So that's a lot of responsibility. You know, like when you're in a big company, you got like mentors and procedures <laughs> and uh, employee resource groups. But you know, when I joined, I didn't, I didn't really have that. And uh, yeah, I, I think I, so when I joined Cash, I was like kind of mentored by one person. And then after two weeks, he left. He quit. Um, it was a little bit. It was uh, one of those groups, uh, you know, he had just had somewhere else to go to. Um, and so by then I was really um, learning a lot on my own. And I learned a lot from my colleagues, too. So I wasn't just just learning on my own. So tell me what happens now. This is now 2018. You get where you are. Is it where you are right now? Is this the next job? Yeah. So 2018 is when I joined uh catch and then well which was called Rio Data at the time and then I left at uh 2021 uh like in January I think I sent my resignation letter like in December of 2020 uh because we had we had just shipped a major product of the pro platform which is health insurance um so that's why I joined the company I was like I'm gonna build health insurance and then I did it so like all right I'm done so, <laughs> uh, so then I got a job at Lola um which is co-founded by uh, the founder of Kayak. Um, so uh, yeah, and it was a B2B uh, company that allowed you to book flights and manage spend. So two things there, I'm curious. Did, did the other company try to save you at all? And how did you um, find out about that, that, that next opportunity? To answer your first question, um, I don't really recall that at all because I already made my decision of leaving. They definitely were not happy about it, um, especially since I gave them two weeks notice. And then so like a little bit of context, we were working on health enrollment and health enrollment only happens very during very specific time of the year, which is like November, December. And so we were working like 50, 60 hour weeks, like pushing code at 1 a.m. And so by then, like after health enrollment ended, we had a week off. And so then that's when I sent my resignation letter because, uh, you know, time to go. And yeah, so they actually wanted me to stay an additional week. But I was like, no. But uh, yeah, so that's the answer to that. But, but that's fair. You did that at the right time. You didn't leave them hanging. You got it all done. Yeah, I didn't leave any loose threads. Not that I think. I mean, we shipped the product. I didn't leave like in the middle of building it. So and then how did you find out about this this new opportunity? I how did I find out about it? I think so I was working with, like talking with recruiters online at the time. Uh they'd reached out to me and one of them uh Meredith uh connected me to uh the back end like uh senior back end engineer opportunity at Lola. Uh and then I decided to like read up about the company and I learned about Paul English and Kayak and I just really like how they were very um human centric um, and just about really valuing their employees and um, understanding that part of treating uh, your employees humanely like aligns with 
you know, treating and valuing your customers too, you know, so I really like that. And so once Meredith shared me opportunity, I applied and then they were, you know, the rest is history. They wanted to interview me and I got it. So it's actually a very quick interview process. Like, I think it happened within two days. They were like, meet everyone. And I was like, okay. So I think like in the evening um, after work, I was like meeting people back to back. It was exhausting. So but it worked out. Remind me, this is the, this is the company that you're at now. No, I'm not at Lola anymore. Okay. Lola was, a, yeah, Lola was acquired by Capital One uh, September of this year. So. Ah, and now you're, did you stay and become? No, sorry, September 2021. Sorry. Last year in September. And you decided not to stay for that merger? Yes, because I was in a different continent. And part of, uh, part of the requirement to join Capital One, uh, which was like very hush-hush at the time, we couldn't tell people, is that uh, in fintech, you have to give a fingerprint and I didn't want to do that. And I was also in a different continent. So um, by then actually I was prepared for this because I don't know, I'm kind of like very much a plan B and C person. So I had already interviewed at several companies once, uh, once we found out that we were being acquired because we really thought of um, their employees and the best package deal for them. But I just wanted to see, maybe I could make myself a better deal out of this outcome. <laughs> I don't know. I kind of made it competitive. Like, can I get myself a better offer uh, than what they were going to give me? And I did. I then I like met uh, the recruiter at Perch, uh, which is the present company I work for, which is an e-commerce company. So you went on a few of these interviews and you decided to choose Perch, right? Mm -hmm. tell, tell me again what actually tell me again why you chose Perch and, and what are some of the problems that they're solving? By the time it's kind of like multifaceted. So. I had actually had my ideas of starting my own product um, already in January of 2021. Um, I think it was like basically at the time, just like personal inventory automation. And it just kind of evolved into this like automated grocery shopping product. Um, and I really like that idea because I actually don't like grocery shopping and I just want AI to do it for me. Um, but I didn't know anything about uh retail <laughs> or supply chain. So uh, when I heard about Perch, uh, you know, a lot of it is, you know, it's, e it's a fundamental and e-commerce company. So I just, you know, knew it'd be a great opportunity to, uh, to learn from them because uh, they had actually grown really quickly um, and had already acquired products and uh, it was a very profitable startup. So I was like, oh, I should learn from the startup because I worked at, you know, I worked at different startups and they're just really good at making money and that's really important. So. All right, we've got about 10 minutes left, so I just want to make sure we, we leverage this time. It, it, it sounds like you are really, you're focusing on an entrepreneur track. It, it, you're looking to kind of build your own company or, or, or build your own product. Is that true? Yeah, so I already have the MVP of the product out. Um, it's, uh, it's called Listful. Uh, it's basically a grocery store, a grocery list app that will help you manage your inventory and help you understand when food goes bad and when you should replace it. Um, it's at listful.ai. It's already out. Um, I need to build more automation to it, but it's there. It's existing. Um, I do, I do want to do the whole other aspect of it, though, which is actually fulfilling groceries, uh, like getting them to you. That's amazing. Is this, you built this completely on your own? Yeah, so I'm lazy. Um, so I decided to learn no code. Um, and I was trying out different no code platforms. So this is actually built from Glide, um, a no code platform. When I first built Listful, I actually learned React Native because uh, I was like, oh, yeah, you know, now I will learn the front end, React State, let's go. And, you know, I had to go, go GraphQL back end. And uh, I wasn't moving fast enough. I was just like getting feedback from people and trying to understand iterate on the product. And I was just like not be able to do it fast enough because I was coding. And so I was like, I need to move faster. And like, as like someone who's trying to come up with the best product for this, um, I need to be able to make this, these kind of changes uh, easier for me. So that's why I switched to no code. But what are you, when are you working on all this stuff? You got a full-time job. You, so you're, you're working on it morning and night when you're not at work, you're working on it on the weekends. I work on it. Uh, so I work at Perch during my day job, you know, regular uh, nine to six or seven schedule. And then I work on Listful at night uh, until like two or 3 a.m. Uh, and I'll work on it on the weekends. 
sometimes I don't sleep because I'm just like really productive. So this is amazing. Does does okay. So this gets interesting to me too. I think we get, we get, we don't have a lot of time left, but is your yeah. So what are your plans for Blissful then? Is it like get it get the product to a point where you can you can get some VC, get it to a point where it's generating enough revenue where you can work full time. What's what's kind of your roadmap there? Deliver value to people. Um, so I want to solve the problem of essentially having something smarter than me figure out when I need to replace my groceries and know when something is fresh enough to eat it. Um, and so I haven't built that part of the automation yet, and that's what I'm working on. Um, and for that, I might have to just go back and go back to my React and GraphQL goes set, set up. But end goal. Um, I think it's just, I don't want to think about it too much because I want to just deliver value. I think the next step would be uh, to actually have um, some kind of, once I understand what people are putting in their grocery list, to find out the 10 most uh, commonly bought items, frequently bought items that have the highest margins, and then uh, start, start a, a farmer, go to the farmer's market in uh, North Carolina, like Raleigh, there's a year round farmer's market and just have a stand and just just have my own little farmer's market with software and just continue delivering value, um, have the automation. And then, cause I need to, you know, I want to make money at every step because uh, I think VC is great, but, and I've worked at startups that raise VC, but I'm a Latin woman um, who's queer. So uh, I already read in Twitter, like how hard it is to raise a woman. And I'm just like, I don't want to have, I don't want to think about that. I just want to make money. So, so that's what I'm going to do. So I'm just building it. And then I'm going to have my own farmer's market stand. Uh, see how much money I can make, see if this is a problem that people are worth pay, you know, want to pay for, and then maybe I'll evaluate um, if it's worth pursuing VC funding. Um, but I have like talked with people um, like David Payne at like Techstars in Atlanta. So, but he's really nice. He just like wants to talk and I like talking with him, but I wasn't like actively raising. That's amazing. I, I, I didn't I never realized how driven you are um, as a person and, and towards your goals and all this time and effort you're putting into these things. I, I, I had no idea. I love it. I, is the, the, the site is, I, I guess the site is public right now then. I could go to the site. Uh, list, like grocery list, like list, and then F-U-L dot A-I. Because, you know, list is always full because uh, it's going to always keep your pantry full. Anyways, whatever. Uh, but, yeah, it's live and you could use it. Um, I have to add uh, more products to it, but people could add their own products too. I have to, my goal is to add like a thousand products by the end of uh February. Wow, that's amazing. And you're doing all this on your own. Is there, if, if if somebody was interested in getting involved in this project, do you have, is that something you're interested in or this right now is kind of a personal project? Yeah, uh, anyone could talk to me. I put my contact information in different parts of the app. So just talk to me. All right, we are out of time. I, I, I can't thank you enough for spending the last hour plus with us talking about um, kind of your life, your tech journey, kind of where you are now, what you're doing. And um, Kathleen, if people want to get in touch with you uh, to talk to you about what they've heard or, or, or maybe even help out on, on your project, um, what's the best way for people to reach out to you? Send me an email at uh, cat at getlistful.com. Uh, so C-A-T ampersand uh, G-E-T uh, L-I-S-T F-U-L uh, dot com. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Okay, thank you again for all your time today and sharing this. This is Bill Kennedy, Kathleen, signing off, and hope to see everybody again real soon.